we realised that it's sacrilege even to put a, 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 a panel saw by a trained a craftsman, a cabinet maker, anyone else, into the woodwork of which those instruments are actually made. It's a special timber imported from a particular country out of a particular forest from a particular tree. Various families, pipes as us individuals call them, carry unique patterns designed often by the man's feeling who built them knowing full well that he would never, never be able to play one, own one or possibly go near one. Isn't it something complete in its entirety for us to look after? Shouldn't they be treasured? There's a smell come from it as you interfere with or take to pieces that makes you say, God, I'm almost on sacred ground. days. I had some terrible letters from various people. Did you know I mention about the one from a parson? Uh, I had no idea of fan mail in those days. The very first postcard I got, I said to my wife, I said, who's this? I don't know this fellow. Uh, I was astounded that people went to the trouble of writing. But after a little while, a postcard arrived from a, a vicar somewhere, I forget now exactly where it was, and it, it was written on a postcard too, which I thought was rather unkind. Um, and it said, we would appreciate your talent more if you played the organ as it should be played, i.e. long sustained chords. Now, I wouldn't have stayed very long at Blackpool if I played a long sustained chords. Not for me to reason why, is it? If they decide I, they don't want me to broadcast, well, there's nothing I can do about it, is it? For 18 years, I did a broadcast on one morning at 10 o'clock on the morning, and they were just dropped like that, completely. And now we have the disc jockeys, don't we? Yes. Cinema organs, or theatre organs as they're sometimes called, are nearly always referred to as Wurlitzers, the mighty Wurlitzer. 
no matter who actually made them, because Wurlitzer was the original. But of course there are English firms that have made them, and indeed Dutch firms. The Compton Company in England, Hill, Norman and Beard made them under the name of Christie. But the genuine Wurlitzer organ was made in America and imported. It was in fact invented by an Englishman, a man called Robert Hope Jones, who lived at Birkenhead. He made church organs, but he had one or two revolutionary ideas, which didn't go down very well with the church organ builders in this country. So he fled to America, as it were, and he teamed up with the Wurlitzer people who were making Nickelodeons and fair organs, that sort of thing. So Mr. Hope Jones sold all his patents to the Wurlitzer people, and they promptly banned him from the factory. This particular instrument, it's quite an old one, an early one, what we refer to as vintage. And the characteristic vintage sound of a Wurlitzer, these lovely, beautiful tibia pipes and the vox humana, which means human voice, but whether it sounds like a human is up to you to decide. But this is the sound you expect from one of these. And, of course, it has all the usual effects. The cathedral chime. The xylophone. Everybody thinks you're very clever because it repeats itself, but all you have to do is hold a note and it does it for you. But uh, the glockenspiel. And one or two drums which we, we can play with our feet. The bass drum. The crash cymbal. Even the sound of steam. Of course, the important thing to realise is that these extras are just gimmicks. The theatre organ was built for entertainment. Its use in the cinema, if anything, made it seem less of an instrument than it really was. The medium wasn't a good one, really, in my opinion. You'd come up there and you got your back to the audience all the time. I mean, in London, in particular, you'd have two films, the usual news film, uh, an orchestra, organist and a stage show. All for ninepence. You were at a disadvantage right from the word go. The sad thing is that musical purists always referred, and still do, to these instruments as machines that bleated like nanny goats, and, and uh, that came about because of the vibrato or the tremulant. You know, a church organ, if I demonstrate, makes a very straight noise like this. And a device called a tremulant, which is a kind of rapidly vibrating bellows, there are two of them on this organ, changes it to this. Gives it a, a vibrato, and that is what the, the church organist disliked. Nonetheless, what those church organists didn't realise was that the best theatre organs wherever they've now finished up, are capable of a sound every bit as magnificent as the very best church organ.
theatre organ works in principle exactly the same as a church organ, only it's just a bit more versatile and complicated. You have two, three, four, or sometimes five keyboards or manuals, surrounding which you have a variety of stop keys which connect these manuals, as it were, with the pipes. By depressing any of these keys, you can connect any of the manuals with more or less any set of pipes by means of a huge series of electric relays. It's really like a mini computer. The pipes are housed in what's called an organ chamber. Sometimes there are two or three, and one of the most magnificent has been newly restored in the Free Trade Hall in Manchester. Well, in this particular chamber, there are 670 pipes. In the main chamber next to it, there are 730 pipes, making a total of 1,400 pipes. Some pipes are metal and some pipes are wood. And, of course, the shorter the pipe, the higher the pitch of the sound produced. The biggest pipe in the organ is in the other chamber. That's a wooden 16-foot pipe. And we also have a 16-foot metal pipe as well, folded to get him to fit in on the shelf. Supporting the organist had selected a trumpet pipe to speak, and he, he chose this particular note. Uh, what would happen? Wind would be released into the bottom of the pipe here, called a boot, and then it would impinge on this tongue called a reed here, which vibrates. This tube is hollow, and the air then escapes up this resonator to make the sound of the pipe. And also, I've estimated that in the organ as a whole, there's about 152 miles, I think, of single-core copper wire, like telephone wire. Little silver wires by the thousand, magnets by the thousand, and little leather motors by the thousand. Everything in the organ, you know, you talk about thousands. At one time, in the 30s, there was getting on for a thousand instruments like this in England alone. Now, there are probably no more than 50. After the war, thanks to the foolishness of certain cinema and theatre owners, most of these organs were just torn out and thrown away. However, a few were saved. Curiously, the, the people who bought these things, more often than not, were not players. I don't really know the reason for this, but uh, you, you've got the case of, of the two brothers' kitchen. This, they built an entire garage showroom to house their newly acquired Wurlitzer organ. Again, neither of the brothers can play it. So, a local school teacher comes in. Now, He's teaching the garage owner's daughters. There's another owned by the boss of an airline company. He's got three organs, actually, and bought this mill and one like it down the road, especially to house them. Another one in Norfolk, owned by a retired printer. It's in the middle of the Broads, on an island almost. The electric blower is in an outhouse round the back. Some organs finished up in very odd places. There's one which my father and I have completely rebuilt in Galston in Norfolk. We rescued it from bits and pieces all over the country, really. The bottom three manuals come from the Savoy Cinema Leicester and the top two from the Queen's Hall Grimsby. There's yet another one in Bolton in Lancashire. Actually, he's also got three in his living room. And 
very beautiful they are too. Some of them, of course, have survived in their original installation. The famous one in the Tower Ballroom in Blackpool, for instance, where Reginald Dixon played for 40 years. Like many of the larger organs, it has a piano attached to it by the electric relays, and you play the piano from the organ console. But, as I said, most of these organs were just thrown away because some cinema accountant thought they were uneconomic. One time, these instruments could be picked up for as little as perhaps 50 pounds or 100 pounds. But suddenly, the interest that's been shown over the last perhaps 10 years, the value has gone soaring. And a relatively small organ was recently offered for sale by the Granada people, I believe, for, I think it was 6,000 pounds. <laughs> console originally came from Aston and Ryan. Yeah. Yeah. The pipe work is Regal uh, Chesterfield, uh, Plaza Birkenhead and ABC Aston. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the church that we belong to, the organ came, from, well not for sale, but it, it, it closed and so we had to rescue it. So it was a case of where shall we put it? We looked in the estate agent's window and said, this looks interesting. Straight away we thought, oh, this is it, you know, it's just what we need. So, um... That was it. We negotiated and that was it, and the price was just incredible. And the people yeah. moved out the front door and the organ moved in the back door. They were moving their first door out at the front as we were... Of course, the pipes came in first, you see, that, that's... Uh, um, Obviously being the most important item of furniture, you know. <laughs> uh, well, look, we had none at the time. Ah, oh, well, that's explains <laughs> a lot. <laughs> so... The house is well suited for the organ, and of course, first of all, we put it upstairs. Which is a... A loft type. Not, not a loft exactly, is it? No, it's a room, really, but uh, but when we put it up there, it was too hot in the summer, and the pipes just started to disintegrate, folding over. So we brought it down and decided, well, two bedrooms aren't being used, we'll use those. This part is the kitchen, which half the organ sticks into. Of course, we had to knock the wall out there. To we didn't take the carpet it. up to do it. And we didn't even take the carpet up, so it was a good job. It's going to say there's no women here. Either. And uh, Nigel enjoys the fact that it's just at the kitchen because we can pass him cups of tea. Oh, yes, and eat your tea well, with one hand and play with the other. It's yeah. not usually cups of tea, really, though, is it? Well, we won't go into that just <laughs> <laughs> And then we come to the bedroom, the loo. The bathroom. And finally, oh, yeah. we get down to... The, the pipe room. The pipe room, where, where, all, where the all the pipes are stored and blasts all the neighbours out, of course. But they don't complain. No complaints. Okay. In fact, they have been known to stand in the garden, haven't they? They do. When, 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 when the Nigel chairs, comes to play, <coughs> is they Bring the deck chairs up. Yes, they come and pretend to be gardening. It's and in here is the relays, which is the electrics, really. If we were married, no housewife would stand for this. So, if we ever leave the place, the console goes with us, and that's why the door's not being repaired. I always say hello to it. Derek talks the pipes. I have a few words with them occasionally, you know, and they want them to behave properly. Upstairs in the attic, or tip, as it's known. If you treat it with respect, it will respond to you, you know, if you ill-treat it, then it plays up. As you can see, the place is loaded with pipes, xylophones, bits and bats. And, bits and, bats. and uh, that's rather an interesting little item there. Um, that's the remains of a thimble crash, a Compton thimble crash. And, um, of course, the tremulance took the roof down. The vibration you can feel all over the house, you know, and from the tremulance, there's four. And, uh, of course, it does bring the slates loose. Loose. And and you'll hear in the nights unless bump onto the floor, you know, the slates slid down. And that's great. This is my bedroom, and, of course, these came from a church organ, which we haven't got room upstairs, so I had to put them in here. They're all perfectly good. And then I've got some, of course, I've got some in here. Pipes everywhere here. I do like to keep a few little gems handy, you know. Um, there's quite a few little bits and bats in here. Oh, dear. But, um, they're all perfectly good and they're all kept and they do no harm, so that's that. So 
I think that's all I can tell you. We owe it to those old boys who did all that work of dedication, left us such a marvellous instrument. We owe it to them to go on from here, those of us who can. There's none of these things that you can bring back after they're gone. They are part of our heritage. There is no replacement. We live in an almost day and age uh, due to civilization and modernization where uh, it's almost a plastic world. Again, we can't do without that. But there's nothing plastic or synthetic about that organ. Nothing at all. Each part of it is the result of individual craftsmanship. Let's put it in simple terms. Those things were made to last, last forever. They need our best.